is thromboembolic disease in pregnancy and perpurium acute management. This is basically the RCOG guideline 37B. Um, okay, so the first point which is um, discussed in this guideline is about the diagnosis of acute venous thromboembolism. How is acute venous thromboembolism diagnosed in pregnancy? As you can see from this figure, that any woman with the symptoms or signs suggestive of venous thromboembolism. You can see in this figure that this is a woman showing the sign of venous thromboembolism. So what we should do, we should have objective testing performed expeditiously and treatment with a low molecular weight heparin should be started as soon as possible until the diagnosis is excluded by uh, the objective testing and unless the treatment is strongly Contradicted. So you can see from this figure that here the objective testing excludes the diagnosis. So we don't have to give heparin at that time. And at the same time, if heparin is um, contraindicated, then we don't have to give it. Otherwise, we have to give it. Okay. Next uh, thing which is discussed here is that individual hospitals should have an agreed protocol for objective diagnosis of suspected venous thromboembolism in pregnancy. And this, they, this may recommend the involvement of different team of doctors. You can see that um, different team of doctors include the obstetrician, radiologist, physician, and hematologist. Okay. Now, another point, what investigations are needed for the diagnosis of an acute venous thromboembolism? Okay. Compression duplex ultrasound should be undertaken where there is a clinical suspicion of the DVT. Okay. Now, you can see from this figure and from other figures some important information. Here, we can see that the ultrasound is negative. If ultrasound is negative and there is low clinical suspicion, anticoagulant treatment can be discontinued. Okay. And now come to the another picture. If the ultrasound is uh, negative and there is a high clinical suspicion uh, exists, then anticoagulant treatment should be discontinued, but ultrasound should be repeated on the day three to seven. Now, question arises, what investigations are needed for the diagnosis of acute pulmonary embolism? Now, here's, we, uh, we have a woman showing the symptoms of the acute venous uh, showing the sign of the acute pulmonary embolism. Women presenting with the sign and symptoms of an acute pulmonary embolism should have an electrocardiogram, ECG, and chest X-ray perform. Okay. Now, in a woman with suspected pulmonary embolism, uh, who also have the symptoms of the DVT compression duplex ultrasound should be performed. If compression ultrasonography confirms the presence of the DVT, no further investigations and treatment um, are necessary means we have to go for the um, treatment straight away. But in another woman, if we have suspected pulmonary embolism without symptoms and sign of DVT, then the VQ scan and CTPA should be performed. When the chest x-ray is abnormal and there is clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism, CTPA should be performed the preference of VQ scan. Anticoagulant treatment should be continued until pulmonary embolism is definitely excluded. So we have to do two things. Either we have to repeat testing or start the uh, anticoagulant treatment until uh, pulmonary embolism is definitely excluded. Now, women with suspected pulmonary embolism should be advised that compared with a CTPA, VQ scan may carry a slightly increased risk of the childhood cancer, but is associated with a low risk of the maternal breast cancer. In both situations, the absolute risk is very small. Now, discussion with a woman is very important, as you can see from the figure, where, where feasible women should be involved in the decision to undergo CTP or VQ scanning. Ideally, ideally informed consent should be obtained before these tests are undertaken. Now, the question arises, should D-dimer testing be performed prior to objective diagnosis? D-dimer testing should not be performed in the investigation of acute venous, pulmo, uh, venous thromboembolism. So, no D-dimer. Now, what is the role of pre-test probability assessment? Clinicians should be aware that at present, 
there is no role of pretest probability assessment in the management of acute venous stroma embolism in the pregnancy now baseline investigation what baseline investigation should be performed before initiating anticoagulant therapy before anticoagulant therapy is commenced blood should be taken for full blood count coagulation screen urea and electrolyte and liver function test and before uh, anticoagulant treatment starting we don't have to do the thrombophilia screen initial anticoagulant treatment of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy what is the initial treatment of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy no in a clinical suspect dvt or pulmonary embolism the treatment with a low molecular weight heparin should be commenced immediately okay you can see that we have to start low molecular weight heparin unless the objective testing for the diagnosis exclude the vte or heparin is contraindicated now what is the therapeutic dose of low molecular weight in heparin in pregnancy now you can see from figure that this low molecular weight heparin should be titrated against the pre pregnancy weight of the patient or if not available the wo woman's booking weight can be can be taken either pre pregnancy or the booking weight now question arises about the single dose or double dose there is insufficient evidence whether we have to give the single dose or the double dose now hospital guideline there should be a clear local hospital guideline for the low molecular weight heparin dosing now should blood test be performed to monitor the heparin therapy in pregnancy routine anti xa monitoring is not done it is done unless the woman is of extreme body weight less than less than 50 kg or 90 kg or more or with a other complicating factor for example with a renal impairment or recurrent vte platelet monitoring should not be performed now those post operative patients or those who are receiving unfraction heparin should have platelet monitoring performed on every second or third day starting from day 4 till day 14 or until heparin is stopped question rises how should massive life threatening pulmonary embolism in the pregnancy and puerperium be managed here you can see a, a massive life threatening pulmonary embolism collapsed shock women who are uh, pregnant or in puerperium should be assessed by the team of experienced clinician including the on call consultant obstetrician now individual basis of patient's management is important women should be managed on individual basis regarding intravenous unfraction heparin therapy or thoracotomy or surgical ambulectomy now you can see the picture of multidisciplinary team including the senior obstetrician should be involved obstetrician and radio, uh, radiologist these are these all should be involved in the management of acute case of the uh, venous thromboembolism now in case of massive pulmonary embolism with a cardiovascular compromise we have to prefer the unfraction heparin unfraction heparin is preferred in case of the massive pulmonary embolism with cardiovascular compromise here you can see maternity units there should be maternity unit guideline for the administration of unfraction heparin here you can see the call and the on call team the on call medical team should be contacted immediately here you can see one or figure and on the left side we have ecg and the ctpa so what does it mean it means that an urgent portable ecg or ctpa within one hour or present of presentation should be arranged and if massive pulmonary embolism is confirmed or in extreme circumstances prior to confirmation immediate thrombolysis should be considered now coming to additional therapies should graduated elastic compression stockings be employed in the acute management of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy in the in immediate management in initial management of the uh, dvt 
<clears throat> the leg should be elevated, as you can see from this finger. And graduated elastic compression stocking applied to reduce edema. Okay, and along with elevation and compression stocking, it would be better if you prefer the mobilization with the stocking. Now, what is the role of inferior vena cava filters in the management of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy? Now, here you can see the inferior vena cava filter and peripartum period is written. So, the guideline says that consideration should be given to the use of temporary inferior vena cava filters in the peripartum period for patients with iliac vein VTE. Here you can see iliac vein VTE. And what is the purpose of it? Purpose is to reduce the risk of pulmonary embolism in patients with a proven DVT or who have recurrent pulmonary embolism despite adequate anticoagulation. Now come to the maintenance treatment of venous from embolism. What is the maintenance treatment of DVT or PE? About this, it's written that treatment with therapeutic dose of subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin should be employed during the remainder of pregnancy for at least six weeks postnatally or until at least three months of the treatment has been given in total. Now... There is a picture showing education of the patient. Education about what? Education about self-injection. Okay. Women should be taught to self-inject lower molecular weight heparin and arrangements should be made to show safe disposal of needles and syringes. And there should be an arrangement of the outpatient monitoring for clinical assessment for platelet monitorings and peak anti-XA level monitoring. Now, some women may develop HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or they may induce, they may um, suffer from heparin allergy. Okay, so those patients who either develop HIT or heparin allergy and they require continuous anticoagulation, in that case, uh, there comes the role of alternative anticoagulant under specialist advice. Now, the question arises, can vitamin K antagonist be used during pregnancy for the maintenance of the treatment of VTE? Now, this, is, this figure explains that warfarin have teratogenic effects. Because of their teratogenic effects on the fetus, vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin should not be used for alternative VTE treatment. Now, the question arises, is there any role for the new anticoagulants in the treatment of VTE in pregnancy? Consideration should be given to the use of the newer anticoagulants like Fondaparinax, Agaturban, and or Herodin in the pregnant women who are unable to tolerate heparin, low molecular weight heparin or infraction heparin, or Danaparite, and who requires continuing anticoagulant therapy. Now come to anticoagulant therapy during labor and delivery. Should anticoagulant therapy be... Um, alter during labor and delivery here you can see that vte is a term when vt occurs at term consideration should be given to the use of intravenous unfraction heparin which is more easily manipulated now here you can see that there is an established labor the woman on low molecular weight heparin for maintenance therapy should be advised that once she is in established labor okay or think she's in labor, she should not inject any further dose of heparin. If she thinks that she is in labor, then she shouldn't get any further dose of heparin. Here you can see delivery is planned, either by cesarean section or, inject, or induction of labor. In both situations, the low molecular weight heparin should be stopped 24 hours prior to the delivery. Here you can see regional analgesia. Regional anesthetic or analgesic technique should not be undertaken until the uh, at least 24 or after the last dose of therapeutic low molecular weight heparin. Now here you can see uh, an explained figure. Low molecular weight heparin should not be Low molecular weight heparin should not be given for four hours after the use of the spinal anesthesia or after the epidural catheter has been removed and epidural catheter should not be removed within 12 hours of the most recent injection. Now the question rises are specific surgical measures required for the anticoagulated patients undergoing delivery by cesarean section? 
yes, you can see from this figure that in a patient receiving therapeutic lower dose of uh, therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin wound drain abdominal and rectus sheath wound drains should be considered as cesarean section and the skin incision should be closed with interrupted sutures to allow drainage of any hematoma. Now, question rises: What anticoagulant therapy should be employed in the woman at the high risk of hemorrhage? Any woman who is considered to be at high risk of hemorrhage and in whom continued heparin therapy is considered essential should be managed with intravenous unfractioned heparin until the risk factors for hemorrhage have been resolved. Now, coming to the postnatal anticoagulation issue, how should an anticoagulation be managed postnatally? About this, it's written that therapeutic anticoagulant therapy should be continued for the duration of the pregnancy and for at least six weeks postnatally or until three months of the treatment has been given in total. Before discontinuing treatment, the continuing risk of thrombosis should be assessed. Now, women should be offered a choice of low molecular weight heparin or oral anticoagulant for the postnatal therapy after discussion about the need for the regular blood test for monitoring of warfarin, particularly during the first 10 days of the treatment. Now, here in this picture, you can see the postnatal period, mother and the baby, and a calendar is shown. Uh, this is basically to explain for how long warfarin should be discontinued or it should be avoided. Warfarin, postpartum was warfarin should be avoided until at least the fifth day and for longer in the patient at increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Now about the breastfeeding, it is written that uh, women can take both heparin and warfarin during the breastfeeding. Both of these are not contraindicated during breastfeeding. The question arises about the prevention of post-thrombotic syndrome. What measures can be employed to prevent the development of post-thrombotic syndrome? About this, it's written that if the woman takes uh, enoxaparin, low molecular weight happen for more than 12 months, there is very low risk of post-thrombotic syndrome. Now, in this figure, you can see the DVT and compression stocking. Following uh, DVT, graduated elastic compression stocking should be worn on the affected leg to reduce the pain and swelling. Clinicians should be aware that the role of compression stocking in the prevention of post-traumatic syndrome is unclear. Here you can see from the picture the um, compression stocking and their role in the prevention of post traumatic syndrome that is unclear but uh, low molecular weight happen can reduce the risk of the post traumatic syndrome now coming to the postnatal clinic review postnatal review of the patients who develop vte during pregnancy or in puerperium should whenever possible be is seen in obstetric medicine clinic and joint obstetric and hematology clinic. In both of these clinics, the patient should be reviewed. Now, the last point, the thrombophilia testing should be performed once the anticoagulant therapy has been discontinued only if it is considered that result would influence the woman future management. So that was all about this guideline. Thank you so much.